Hello, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And uh, in a special way, I would like to welcome our speakers for today. Um, we have Professor Andreas Obapantaka, who is Professor of Philosophy at the University of Innsbruck in Austria. He is specializing in political and theory, aesthetics, and And we have Professor Rina Aluri, who is professor and head of the unit for peace and conflict studies at the University of Innsbruck, Austria. She's also the head of the research center in peace. It's really a pleasure having you. And the theme today is very important. It's uh, decolonizing peace and conflict studies, experiences and approaches. And at this moment, I'd like to bring you also special greetings from Professor Matt Meyer in New York City. He is uh, the Secretary General of the International Peace Research Association. He's so much interested in the topic today, and um, he wanted really, wished to be here with us, but he couldn't. But he asked me uh, to thank you, uh, our speakers, for this important topic. And he actually promised that he would be visiting Innsbruck sometime, probably next month. And um, so we hope that, uh, well, after the, your presentations, which you can uh, share now since you are a co-host, and uh, we will have questions and discussions. And um, so, yes. And I would like to also for today actually um, apologize because uh, there is the background noise on my side, but I hope that uh, our colleagues will be able to assist in case you know you can't hear me properly. Uh, Clara and Nick Krause, thank you very much for being with us. And of course the entire team in Argentina for the technology and for recording this uh, program. So. I would like now to ask, to ask um, Andreas and Rina to start, please. Thank you very much indeed for coming. Thank you very much. Um, I will just share my screen. Just give me one moment. Perfect. Uh, sorry, Professor Mutalemwa, it says that the screen sharing is disabled. Are you able to, is someone able to give me the yes, possibility you, to share? Hello, if you give me Hi. just a second, I, I will uh, um, tell the, the technical. Perfect, thank you. Uh, sorry, Professor. Could and uh, Professor Oberbrancher uh, share a screen because he is co-host. Is there a problem? No, I, I can share the screen. But since we are sitting on two different laptops, I think that my colleague Rina would first have to come over and uh, or send me her presentation and we have to upload it from here um, but if you give us two minutes then we will uh, rearrange that and we should be ready for that would it work for you Rina <laughs> 
sorry for the Okay, I think we are technically sorted. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, as mentioned, uh, my name is Rena Lurie. I'm the head of Unit of Peace and Conflict Studies here at the University of Innsbruck, and I'm accompanied by my colleague, um, Professor Dr. Andreas Oberplantache, who is the director of the MA program in Peace and Conflict Studies. So we're speaking today um, with all of you about decolonizing peace and conflict studies, experiences, and approaches. Um, because we are uh, dealing with some tech, you will just hear me giving indication to my colleague um, when to go to the next slide. So please go to the next slide. What does it mean to decolonize peace education? Uh, from my perspective, this has a certain level of starting points. It means that all of us, so not just us in our program in terms of peace and conflict studies, but also academics, scholars, researchers, practitioners within the field of education generally, but peace studies specifically, need to find ways to consciously learn from and teach diverse views and perspectives. This may seem like a given. This may seem like Obviously, if we're in this field, this is what we want to do. Um, but I would like to problematize a little bit today um, why this continues to be, uh, needs to be an active, conscious practice in terms of decolonizing education. This invites a questioning of our own positionalities, so not just the positionalities of, of others who are conducting research on or students that we have in our classroom, but also us as educators um, what is our uh, um, background in terms of uh, nationality, in terms of gender, in terms of uh, sex, in terms of discipline, in terms of where we were born and raised and socialized? And how do these positionalities influence the field, whether the field is the table that I'm sitting on right now, as that is the place that I'm conducting my research, or um, an external location where I'm conducting empirical research? We need to be aware of our positionalities, but also our own unconscious biases, learning and unlearning as peace educators and practitioners. Further, we need to acknowledge that we have been trained and socialized in disciplines and approaches that are rooted in coloniality, patriarchy, heteronormity, and uh, heteronormativity and white supremacy. And I state this as a perspective from my view that these are the spaces in which I myself and many of my colleagues have been socialized and not as a debate um, up for discussion, but actually a fact in terms of the knowledge processes that we have been part of. Next slide, please. So some of the guiding questions um, to support our discussion and our learning today um, are related to who are we learning from and who are we not learning from? So this is also an invitation to everybody in the audience to even take a moment to think, who have I learned from? So who are uh, uh, the people in which you have had the chance to participate in classes with? Who are the people who have stood in front of the classroom with you? Uh, the colleagues in conferences and workshops and whatnot. Um, who have you had the opportunity to learn from? But also who do we look up to as role models in our education and career? Uh, who are the people who have been present on one side that we have gone into a classroom and had someone who is standing in front of us as a role model, but also people who we have consciously sought out, people who have said, that to me is a person of a role model, that is someone that I want to follow, be in touch with, um, do research with, et cetera. Who holds power in higher education institutions and who does not hold power? Um, I think that very often uh, uh, on a very daily basis, we get, we, we, we see a job, we apply for a job and we start a job. And we don't actually always know what are the powers and structures and institutions that exist within that position before we begin. Um, and this is something also uh, in terms of reflexivity, reflecting on the spaces that we are in, but also um, how can we be more aware of the spaces in which we enter into sometimes consciously and unconsciously and where are the dynamics of power in those spaces? whose voices, experiences, and agencies are marginalized and silenced in our institutions. So if there are certain voices, role models, um, uh, educators, professors, practitioners who are standing in front of the room, 
who is not standing in front of the room, uh, who, who are the people and perspectives which we have not been able to hear um, due to a variety of reasons in terms of um, access, um, inequality, um, opportunities, et cetera, et cetera. And this is an acknowledgement of the fact that we are all part of an imperfect sector. Um, and I speak now on behalf of my own sector of peace and conflict studies, but I think this applies to many um, interdisciplinary programs that are connected also to peace and conflict studies in an imperfect system in which education um, and learning institutions are rooted in, but also the society at large. So again, I, I speak um, in terms of my own positionality today from the discipline of peace and conflict studies, which is extremely broad, interdisciplinary, and intersectional, um, and, and hope that also those from other disciplines can also benefit from some of these insights. Um, next slide, please. In order to do this, um, I'm using one particular article as a frame. Uh, this is an article by Kess, Marx, and Ramagondo of 2020 called Decolonizing African Studies. So the article was written um, for the field of African studies, but I have found it very useful um, as a guidance um, in terms of understanding what decolonizing education more broadly can look like, but also trying to see how to apply it within the field of peace studies itself. So this article um, reflects on an approach that sees decolonizing as a verb and as a subject of study, a methodological as well as epistemic orientation and theory and praxis, practice or praxis of research and te teaching. It identifies decolonizing as something that entails a political and normative ethic and practice of resistance and intentional undoing. I think this is very important that, that it doesn't just happen, that it requires acknowledgement, but also very much intentional action. Okay, now that I acknowledge that this is inherent in my discipline, in my practice, how can I move towards undoing? How can I move towards unlearning and towards intentional practice? And linked to this, this requires the unlearning, the dismantling of unjust practices, assumptions, and institutions, as well as persistent positive action to create and build alternative spaces, networks, and ways of knowing that transcend our epicolonial inheritance. They identify four forms of decolonizing work, which I will go into. The first is structural, second epistemic, third personal, and fourth relational. For me, the first and last question of decolonization work should be, who does it serve and what or whom does it center? And I see this as a, an overarching guiding question, whether you're coming from a scholarly research or practitioner background, we tend to see decolonization as a buzzword nowadays. We put it on everything. You decolonize your um, reading list, you decolonize your um, social media consumption, your music lists, your um, novel lists, uh, your uh, yoga teachers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think sometimes we get lost in what that can actually look like. What does decolonizing mean in a very um, reflective, but also practical term? And so for me, the constant question is, who does it serve and what or whom does it center? Next slide, please. So the first element of decolonizing work is the structural. This essentially means the redistribution of resources and opportunities, as well as addressing issues related to equity and access. And I'll go into this. Next slide, please. So this means um, on the one side, as I mentioned earlier, the jobs, the positions that are available or not available to certain persons of the society. So what are the institutions, what are the jobs, the titles, the professional recognition, the research budgets in terms of projects, in terms of uh, grants, um, leadership, but also gatekeeping roles, scholarships and entries of admission. And again, we speak um, here in, in a unit, in an institute that has an MA program of peace and conflict studies. And I think that it's important that there is also, of course, different levels of this. There's already at the entry in terms of who is able to access an MA program in terms of knowing that it exists, having the resources to apply, but once accepted, able to also fulfill any tuition requirements, relocation requirements, living requirements. If we speak, of course, on behalf of also um, faculty and staff, 
this requires also a questioning of, of access, knowledge that, this, that such positions exist, but also ability to move and, and willingness also to move to certain locations um, um, for this kinds of access. Secondly, distribution. So how does distribution of jobs, how does the distribution of scholarships echo and reproduce colonial relations? In terms of st structural decolonization, it requires a recentering of power. So previously I mentioned who is holding power in the institutions, where is power being wielded? Um, uh, the decolonization of the structural elements requires a recentering and acknowledging, okay, power is being held there. And how can we within educational institutions and structures include historically marginalized voices and perspectives in new forms and new ways? Um, fourthly, the role of educators. So how can we support and uplift others so that they can access opportunities and climb the hierarchical and educational ladder? And again, I see this very much at a student level. So how can we uplift students to have access to such opportunities, but also once uh, students may have a master's once they may have a PhD, and it's about also accessing opportunities in terms of, um, you know, whether it's research um, grants or tenure or whatnot, how can we uplift to ensure that um, historically marginalized voices also have access to such positions. Next slide, please. The second aspect is epistemological decolonization. So, um, essentially, how do we decolonize? our knowledge and our perspectives of knowledge. So this is the redemption of worldviews and theories and ways of knowing that are not rooted in and not oriented around Euro-American theory. In this way, we question that knowledge is not purely rational. Um, so actually who I am does matter in terms of what knowledge I can impart. And I think this is a very um, challenging uh, uh, aspect of decolonization, particularly from an educator perspective um, where we have also been socialized um, and also exposed to certain kinds of readings. We have been socialized and exposed to certain authors that are seen as the canon of our field, that are identified as authors and perspectives and theories that in order to climb such ladders, we need to know. We need to have criticized them, we need to have analyzed them, and we need to have written and published on them. So how can one on one side question the Euro-American theory being uh, uh, also problematic in its root, while at the same time being able to climb the ladder uh, of, of academia, of, of peace and conflict theories, and while acknowledging that other voices are not being heard in terms of those worldviews. Next slide, please. So to go in um, into this very much on an individual level, me, myself, and I, Rena Lurie, who am I? as an educator, um, who are we as educators and who are they as educators? And how can each of us reflect on our own subjectivity, situatedness and positionality in a way that this matters? So in a way that I am not forced to only identify myself by my position um, as a head of unit or as an assistant professor, but I can identify myself as someone who is a woman of color um, I can identify myself as someone who is of mixed origin, uh, of someone who is connected both to Global North and Global South. And by stating that, I am not diminishing my quality in academia. I am not diminishing my perspective as being limited, but actually um, providing value to that positionality. So the epistemic decolonization, as previously mentioned, rejects a European Age of Enlightenment claim um, that scientific knowledge is inherently and necessarily rational objective and universal. In this way, objectivity is also socially constructed and only knowledges in their plurality can actually be universal. This is also a very deep aspect of unlearning um, that, that as educators, we are not and should not pretend to be neutral, void of voice, uh, perspective that is um, also actually unique to my particular identity. Uh, next slide, please. So the third level, personal decolonization. At this level, we reflect on our everyday actions, how we uh, uh, relate to the personal decolonizing work. So this requires our own cultivation of consciousness and engagement as what um, Ramagondo 2019 calls disobedient de decolonial praxis. 
in a way, doing the work on yourself and not accepting others to do it for you, but seeing it as an active engagement of self-work. Next slide, please. What does this require? Um, it requires being aware of the fact that in our fields and in our disciplines, we have been encouraged, um, supported, and told um, to mimic behaviors and actions, um, that these behaviors and actions can be incentivized for upward mobility. Um, this includes a way of speaking, a way of teaching, a way of attending conferences, a way of dressing, uh, a way of doing research or through citation practices, and very much acknowledging that it, it remains practically impossible to completely reject these practices when we are in this field. Um, however, it requires, a, a, again, a questioning of what are the practices which are required and in what ways can we also um, um, enable a form of repractice. Uh, so being aware that these, pra these practices and behaviors are rooted in hegemonic practices that aim to maintain a certain status quo. Um, it, it aims to ensure that certain persons of particular race, gender, sexuality, uh, nationality, ethnicity, etc., remain in subservient positions. Um, this, this work refers to scholars such as Stephen Biko, Franz Fanon, and Enrique Dussel, who reflect on what is occupational consciousness? How can we on one side be in an occupation and at the same time critically reflect it? When we think about research, it also questions what is the local in terms of local agency, local knowledge, local reflection, um, and also this idea of de-romanticizing and de-exoticizing what field research really means. Again, that field research or research can happen at this desk um, and, and, and at this knowledge as a space, as a location, and not a requirement that one needs to go to the field out there where there are others that are different from oneself in order to be qualified uh, as a significant and acceptable researcher in their own regard. <clears throat> so it requires critical awareness to acknowledge, I have been told that I need to behave a certain way in order to maintain the status quo. And if I do this, again, within my own positionality, and I speak as myself, um, if I do this, if I do not critically reflect, if I ensure that the status quo is maintained, then I myself am contributing to my own oppression. It's slide uh, 10. Instead, um, I need to question these norms and adopt transgressive acts to disrupt the cycle of oppression through everyday undoing for both individual and collective well-being. The last one is relational decolonizing. And this is recognizing human agency and our interdependence. This requires that people have an active creation of equity, mutuality, reciprocity that cuts against the grain of privilege and power. In essence, how do we relate to others around us? How do we engage with our colleagues who may or may not be aware of such um, um, forms of, of colonization or decolonization that needs to happen on a relational level? Next slide, please. So in this way, we have um, structures, epistemology, estimology, epistemologies, um, and actions alike that are dependent on human relations. So all of the other layers are related, are connected to the relational. The question is, how do we, again, as researchers, as educators, as practitioners, how do we unintentionally sustain and replicate systems of power and exclusion because we have been socialized to do so, because we've been taught to do so, because we don't know any other way of being as this is the form of education um, and institutions that we have been reflected on. So in this sense, relational decolonizing requires human agency and our interdependence. There's a, a very specific request that comes out of this article where they say active creation of equity mutuality and reciprocity that cuts against the grain of privilege and power. That we all need to do the extra work, catch up on debates that are led by scholars from and based in their own context, as well as indigenous knowledge processes and public discourses. There's a very active purpose in what ways can we listen and dialogue and not commodify and co-opt. So here is an invitation. Um, to create space for and seed space to scholars from excluded and marginalized communities, whether they have been marginalized due to gendered, racialized, epistemic, religious, 
ethno-linguistic or embodied hierarchies or any other forms of discrimination. Next slide, please. So in this way, decolonizing knowledge and practice requires all of us, not only some of us, but all of us, to open our eyes, critically question the norms and standards that have been fed to us about education and to make space for new ways of knowing, learning, thinking, and doing. Next slide, please. So this begs the question, how can we, we as in me, myself, and I, my colleagues, but also all of you here today, how can we nurture a diverse, equitable, inclusive peace studies program um, that promotes our collective liberation? Um, and I will now um, pass on to my colleague, Andreas Oberprantacher, to reflect on some of the ways in which we see um, how uh, we are seeing the opportunity to do this. Thank you. Thank you, Rina, so much for your presentation. I would now slightly, but just slightly shift the perspective on our various experiences when it comes to doing decolonization in this double sense as a verb and as a noun, um, and how this reflects also our own very personal experiences, as Rina has already mentioned, this is an ongoing process. So in that sense, we don't have any kind of definitive answer, but rather we would like to share some of our experiences and some of our concerns related to our experiences. In a way, we are in the midst of this uh, process and uh, we're still very much, let's say, experientially linked to this situation of transforming, transitioning of both unlearning and relearning ourselves, what it can mean to do peace and conflict studies in a different way, in a way that also considers the importance of decolonization. I would like to start by returning to something that was implicitly already mentioned by Rina on the importance of considering, especially also for the field of peace and conflict studies, the power knowledge nexus, as Foucault has termed it, when it comes to understanding perhaps a certain colonial legacy, even of peace and conflict studies. And in my view, the link between peace and conflict studies and colonial imperial interests is, rather tricky because one could certainly say that a certain history of peace and conflict studies has indeed set out to critique imperialist and colonialist interests. So how could we even argue that some of these interests might be part of the legacy and of the tradition of peace and conflict studies? I will return to this in the latter part of my talk. I will then briefly give an overview, a rather fragmentary overview of um, what we are doing at our MA program in Peace and Conflict Studies at the University of Innsbruck and how this is recently linked to our efforts of further decolonizing our MA program and ensuring a more, let's say, participatory and also emancipatory practice um, that we see as integral, an integral part of our May program. To return briefly to the power knowledge nexus means, first of all, to remind ourselves that uh, when it comes to such keywords of um, doing science in any possible way, and not least also of peace and conflict um, studies, uh, that research itself is not a neutral term, but that research in a sense was very often used so as to promote colonialist and imperialist interests. And in that sense, Linda, 
to Hivai Smith is absolutely right when she um, states right at the beginning of her book on decolonizing methodologies that from the vantage point of the colonized, the term research is inextricably linked to European, one could also add American imperialism and colonialism. The word itself, research, is probably one of the dirtiest words in the indigenous world's vocabulary. When mentioned in many indigenous contexts, it stirs up silence, it conjures up bad memories, it rises a smile that is knowing and distrustful. The ways in which scientific research is implicated in the worst excesses of colonialism remains a powerful remembered history for many of the world's colonized people. I myself, I'm first of all, and that is part of my, let's say, professional or one part of my professional identity, a practical philosopher. And in philosophy, particularly, we can strongly argue that these colonial legacies and these imperial interests are very much part of the history of philosophical reasoning. One could it indeed um, argue that many of those words that used to legitimize imperialism and colonialism had and still have a strong philosophical meaning, be it reason, be it progress, be it civilization, be it truth and so forth. So I'm mentioning this because um, decolonizing research is a particularly important task for the field of philosophy itself. But one could certainly say that um, decolonization has become a buzzword in basically almost all fields of scientific research and scientific practice. So when one looks at uh, many of the scientific practices, even here in Austria, which certainly has also a colonial um, legacy and a colonial past. One finds that there are a number of um, efforts to decolonize institutions, be it um, especially museums like the World Museum in Vienna that knows that a lot of the um, objects that it has collected over the past centuries, uh, but not just the object that it has collected, also the way in which these objects were shown to the public, the ways in which uh, stories were told about different parts of the world are strongly linked to colonial imaginaries. Unfortunately, one can certainly also argue, at least for a number of important uh, Austrian institutions, there is a rising awareness that um, it is indeed paramount to decolonize these institutional frameworks and to come to critical terms with their own past. This is certainly also true for universities. One could think, for example, of the rather well-known case of the uh, School of um, Oriental and African Studies in the UK as being an institution that was specifically created for the purpose to support the colonial administration, not least also mm -hmm. in India and in different other parts of the British Empire. This alone is also a very strong indicator that the ways um, universities and institutions were accumulating knowledge was very often and very strongly linked to colonialist and imperialist um, interests. And for my field, uh, specifically for the field of philosophy, there are indeed since a number of um, years now growing interests in breaking with these traditions of um, thinking of certain terms as if they were not linked to colonialist and imperialist endeavors. Provincializing Europe in that sense means also to critically come to new terms with uh, keywords like modernity itself or with ideas about reasoning uh, about our 
futures and our past. What is certainly the case for a number of uh, scientific fields makes it, in my view, quite tricky when it comes to peace and conflict studies in particular, because one could, first of all, say that peace and conflict studies shares from the very beginning a strong interest in breaking with uh, colonialist and imperialist legacies. Indeed, if one thinks, for example, of uh, Johann Galtung's work, uh, one could certainly say that um, from the beginning, Galtung had a strong interest in basically also developing anti-colonialist and anti-imperialist um, theories linked to peace and conflict studies. So this makes it quite tricky because there is a certain sense, I would argue, invested in the very history of peace and conflict studies that um, could be read in a, in a way as if uh, peace and conflict studies was immune to such um, colonialist and imperialist forms of reasoning, as if these legacies were not part of um, peace and conflict studies itself, because it started from the very effort to critically break with these traditions. Um, it makes it tricky because I would argue that still we find part of this past and part of this um, complicities nonetheless involved even in contemporary forms of how peace and conflict studies is being performed. And in order to illustrate uh, what I mean by these kinds of complicities and by kinds of these more implicit forms of legacies, I will also refer to our own experiences and to our own MA program. Before I go into more specific details, I would like to provide you um, a very fragmentary overview of our MA program in peace and conflict studies and illustrate quickly what we're doing, how we're doing it, who our students are, and where we are also located. The MA program is currently undergoing a very comprehensive transformation and transition, which um, refers to the fact that for the past 20 years, we have already been an MA program, but a very specific MA program. We were and we are still an MA program that is related to a um, specific study regime. That's the continual education study regime, meaning that we had an MA program now for 20 years that was uh, created by the combined effort of um, institutional actors, but also scholars, um, the most famous being Wolfgang Dietrich and uh, people standing close to him, like uh, Norbert Koppensteiner, Josefina Echevarria, um, Daniela Ingruber, and a number of others. But for the past 20 years, this MA program was also a rather precarious MA program, since it was based, first of all, on funding, on funding of the state of Tyrol, on tuition fees, and it was not fully integrated into the body of the University of Innsbruck. A call, a basic and foundational text that precedes the very history of the MA program in peace and conflict studies at the University of Innsbruck was the call for many pieces written by Wolfgang Dietrich and Wolfgang Sützel, which in a way summarized the main drive of um, that what was then eventually also becoming the Innsbruck School of Peace and Conflict Studies. The very beginning was marked by the interest of uh, pluralizing the term peace itself by also pointing to the very also colonial history of um, peace as a concept that was rooted in a certain, let's say, history not least that of uh, philosophical modernity by exposing the monolingual and even monotheistic understanding of such a peace tradition. So the very call for many pieces was indeed an effort of breaking with this 
modernist uh, concept of peace by bringing to the fore different other understandings of peace itself. So in a way, one could say at the very beginning also of our MA program stands the effort of critically reflecting on colonial legacies and traditions invested in the concept of peace itself. These efforts were awarded um, with um, UNESCO Chair for Peace Studies in 2008 that rests with us uh, ever since. And it is part also of um, our OME program in the sense that this is part of what we could also call our symbolic uh, capital. The way we are doing peace and conflict studies here can be summarized as an effort of doing peace and conflict studies, especially by bringing together peers from all over the world, by creating rich and very diverse learning environments, uh, learning environments that are reflecting the efforts to promote peace building through peaceful means, also by creating peace education settings that are reflecting these efforts in terms of giving our students opportunities as core scientists, as um, students that are not just here to gather knowledge, but that are actively creating knowledge together with us that are sitting with us together and that are driving further peace and conflict studies. But apart from the settings themselves and from new learning formats that we are using here and that we are experimenting with also, our MA program is divided into five different parts, one of which is perhaps the most intense and also the most challenging one because it involves also um, a cooperation, a very um, specific form of cooperation with on the one hand military actors such as the Austrian armed forces, but also uh, cooperations with other actors that nonetheless share a certain military tradition in terms of how they're being organized, be it um, the firefighters, be it the water rescue, uh, be it uh, the Red Cross, et cetera, et cetera. So one of our, let's say, core elements of our program is that of creating a specific learning environment in terms of um, uh, civil and military cooperation that um, in winter is happening under also under, under specific uh, snowy conditions in high alpine um, areas and in summer um, means also that we are making use of uh, water and um, um, of uh, other places that we are able to access through our partner organizations. So part of this um, core module here means for our students that they are playing roles of um, civilian mission in a post-conflict zone that is created by the Austrian Armed Forces in close collaboration with us and that we are then also debriefing on several levels and supporting also for further professionals, be it further role players, be it therapists, be it also further professionals that we are engaging in in terms of leadership training, etc. Other parts, um, and this refers to the final parts of our program, are more body-oriented and transformative, where we are also making sure that when we're speaking here of learning, that it's really an integral form of learning, a comprehensive form of learning, where learning is also performed in a way where we are making a different use of, of settings, of areas, of zones, coming together and experiencing also, let's say, body interactions um, as a way of um, promoting peace and conflict studies. Um, so what are our specific experiences of further decolonizing DMA program? What we have witnessed over the past two years since Rina and I 
have taken over uh, specific forms of responsibilities in this MA program. I'm basically the, uh, I have been appointed as the director of this MA program since July last year. And Rina is the head of the unit and at the same time also the speaker of the research center is that even though from the very beginning, the Innsbruck um, MA program um, had, shown a strong passion of decolonizing peace and conflict studies by promoting a very inclusive understanding of uh, how to do peace and conflict studies by pluralizing the term peace itself, by promoting also a transrational understanding of peace and conflict studies, and by promoting also a more elicitive conflict transformation that still implicitly we encountered a number of um, let's say paradoxes or let's say we could say that there were some blurry areas blurry zones where some of that what was part of our ma program was nonetheless linked to that what we could still interpret uh, a certain complicity in uh, colonial interests and um, also uh, traditions so on the one hand, and this doesn't mean that one leads to the other, but nonetheless that one is in a way also linked to the other, or where I would say that it's impossible to speak about one without also speaking about the other, we find that forms of cultural appreciation that are very much part of our MA, of our MA program are in a way linked to forms or could be linked to forms of cultural appropriation or where at least it's quite difficult for us to draw a clear line. So on the one hand, um, from the very beginning, our May program valued uh, very much, let's say, cultural diversity and it integrated this cultural diversity in learning processes, but we realized also that it's difficult to say where exactly this integration could also result in a form of cultural appropriation. We could say also that um, a certain interest in focusing also on forms of vernacular or also indigenous uh, practices is in a certain sense also linked to forms of exoticization where we also find that um, referring to certain practices as indigenous practices of uh, knowledge or of um, doing peace and conflict studies could also contribute to forms of othering of the forms of stereotyping by framing them already as indigenous without at the same time reflecting on what the term indigenous means, to what extent also indigenous itself is in a way a colonialist category. We find also that uh, this emphasis of epistemic pluralism, of um, considering the plurality of knowledges from around uh, the world, can again also easily resolve uh, result in a form of knowledge accumulation. This obviously is also linked to the more broader tendency that still today most of the peace and conflict studies program are still linked in the global north, be it the United States, uh, be it Europe. And one could certainly say that um, even nowadays, most of the chairs and professorships in post-colonial studies or decolonial studies are also located in uh, the northern parts of the Americas and in Europe, which in a sense too means that um, also here we find a form of knowledge accumulation that is still taking place. One could also argue that the specific focus of our MA program on transrational peace education and elicitive conflict transformation is not that clearly linked to, let's say, post-colonial peace education and intersectional conflict transformation meaning that to a certain extent our focus on the transrational and the elicitive to a certain extent happened uh, on the expense of um, focusing less 
on the importance of uh, post-colonial approaches and intersectional approaches. And what we still also find very much in our program is that even though we have a very um, strong and um, um, a very visible also student body of um, black and indigenous um, people of color, uh, we nonetheless move here in a clearly white environment. So the, the whole MA program is located here in Austria. The, the whole surrounding of the staff um, of many of the facilitators of the partner organizations, not least the Austrian Armed Forces and so on, are clearly also uh, white. In that sense, we find also a further contradiction and paradox here. So the struggles of the past two years could be summarized in uh, the following uh, terms. We found that even though we have a very strong and, um, and very thriving uh, group um, of uh, Black indigenous, indigenous people of color in our student body, the, the very participation and representation of this group at best was only fragmentary. It was involved, obviously, in all the activities, uh, but it never fully felt acknowledged for being there. So even though there were comprehensive efforts of participating and of sharing and representing, the sense was still that there was some kind of white hegemony when it came, for example, to um, voicing certain interests. So we realized that nonetheless, it was mainly white, very often European students that were more able in sharing, addressing their interests in making their claims heard, while very often many of other, our other students remained rather silent. Uh, it was also voiced in the past two years uh, that there was a certain discontent with the modes of communication and presentation also of, uh, of knowledge. We found that there are still very much traditions of bias invested in a number of um, lecture units, but also experts that came and that provided us with expert knowledge. A specific example could be that of a professional uh, working uh, for Medicine Sans Frontières, who shared um, her, let's say, professional expertise of what it means to work in uh, environments such as um, refugee camps. And the way this person addressed um, her professional experience was by basically suggesting that, uh, well, I mean, here we have target countries. These are our target countries. And this is what we're doing in these target countries without realizing that many of our students come from these so-called target countries. And in this sense, this asymmetry was already suggesting, OK, um, it is clear for this professional. Uh, we are standing here. And this is the work we're doing there. And this is basically our area of problems where we have to do something about it without acknowledging that basically our setting was so that the students involved in this very workshop uh, were experiencing as, this as very offensive also in respect of their own um, experiences and their own positions. We found also that the diversity invested in our uh, program was precarious in the sense that especially those students who voiced their concerns about um, how diversity matters, uh, realized that all of a sudden they had uh, multiple burdens, um, meaning that they should all of a sudden also teach uh, white students what it means to make certain experiences of discrimination. So meaning, that non-white students were often pushed into specific roles by becoming experts on, let's say, uh, racist, racist or sexist discrimination, and they should now share their knowledge with the white students. And this was also uh, articulated as an additional burden. They shouldn't just be students like any other students, but they should also act as experts when it came to discrimination and what to do about discrimination. We realized, we realized also 
that um, among our students and among our faculty members that there was uh, different levels of uh, education and experience when it comes to um, understanding uh, colonial pasts and, and, and presence. So some had, let's say, a stronger interest in, in that and in also trying to undo that while others uh, were less informed and for them these were basically also new words that they had to first of all uh, learn. So also when it comes to discrimination and um, um, in terms of um, especially also racism, um, this was not equally distributed as an experience or as a, or as a form of education among our faculty members or among our students. And um, an additional, um, let's say, um, challenge for us is that all of these concerns and all of this, this content and all of these struggles in a way um, intensified over the past two years in the midst of a already complex transition and transformation that we are undergoing. So what is currently happening and what are some of our experiences related to our MA program? We do have indeed a number of initiatives that are currently taking place and that are trying to ensure that decolonization is understood both as a noun, meaning that it is specifically also addressed as a topic in our lectures, that it is also a topic that is part of our curriculum, that is a topic that is part of our workshop, but it is also a verb in terms of how it is performed uh, by our MA program. We have a number of initiatives, some of which are more student-led, student-driven, some are more faculty-led and faculty-driven, some are more formal, others are more informal, some are more institutional, uh, some are more, let's say, also flexible. One of the examples that I would Yeah, I think I've been muted automatically twice. Some of the um, initiatives that I would like to briefly share here as examples is, for example, that of uh, um, intercultural dialogue that is ongoing, that as one of its products has also created a, a workbook on um, how to become mindful of hegemonic dominance and oppression especially when it comes to experiences of racism and um, white supremacy. So this is an initiative that is very much also student-led and student-driven, where um, a group of students organized themselves with a number of others uh, and produced this workbook and uh, basically invited other students to go through this workbook and to educate themselves as an effort to make sure that um, decolonization becomes something that is also integrated very much also in the educational process of our May program. Um, a shout out to Rina, my colleague. She has also put together a number of these experiences in terms of a facilitator info sheet that we are now handing out to all the facilitators that are coming to our May program and that are perhaps um, less aware and less experienced of, um, of the different struggles that we have facing over the past two years, so that they are, or they can also prepare themselves better, what it means to basically do something for our MA program, be it by offering a course or a workshop. So this info sheet is also summarizing some of the main topics and it is also contributing to a certain sensibility that we would like to ensure as a general framework. When it comes to the more institutional access to our MA program, also that was already addressed uh, by Rina, we have been redesigning our admission process and um, our reading list that needs to be read by all uh, future students uh, has been rearranged in a way where we are trying to make sure that we have not just let's say the classical canonical text of peace and conflict studies but that the number of topics and the number of people sharing experiences are involved that um, should also illustrate that peace and conflict studies 
is a very diverse field of studies, a diverse field of studies where intersectionality and decolonial approaches do indeed matter. So the people should already have the opportunity from the very beginning to come across such texts and then realize if that is really that kind of study that they want to pursue. Last but not least, also in terms of the curriculum itself, we have now a new curriculum that has not been translated yet into English. So the basic text that needed to be approved by the Senate of the University of Innsbruck is in German. Therefore, I'm not yet uh, sharing it because um, it wouldn't make any sense here. Uh, but the curriculum itself has also been redesigned in a way where we are also making clear in all different modules that intersectionality, decolonization, and, and post-colonial studies, um, uh, amongst others, are crucial themes for us that we need to um, um, have integrated in all possible uh, modules. And apart from that, we have continual and ongoing discussions among us as uh, faculty members, as, as staff members uh, on an institutional level. So what we are doing here is also in a very much uh, also related to the efforts of the University of Innsbruck itself of um, ensuring a diversity on all different levels, and at least also for our fields of research related to arts and humanities and the social sciences of making sure that um, decolonization is taken seriously, not just as a, as a noun, but also as a, as a verb. So these are some of our experiences and our approaches. And with that, I'm done also with my part of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much indeed for your nice presentation. It has been quite informative, well, well researched and uh, explained. Thank you both for this wonderful talk. And now I'd like to ask uh, members for questions and comments, because you can also put them in chat. Um, and uh, just raise your hand or the golden hand that technology has offered us. Um, and since there's still some background noise on my part, uh, uh, Clara, please, would you take over and, uh, you know, uh, moderate? We can do it together, of course. Uh, Yes, of course. Uh, give me just. Right. Yes. Do you hear me well? Yes, I do. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Thanks both for your excellent presentation. So we will start with the questions and answer. I don't know if we, any any one of you have uh, questions for the speakers. Please uh, turn on your microphones. So if anyone has some questions for the speakers, please turn out, turn the, uh, sorry, turn your micro, Microsoft on and you can freely ask the questions. Uh, mine is not a question, but the uh, appreciation. Uh, Andreas and uh, and uh, his colleagues' um, presentation were so beautiful because it reminds me um, 
uh, when I was doing my master's in uh, in uh, peace studies in Bradford in uh, UK, long ago, to, about uh, 20 years now, that was so manifest how colonial model of education of uh, uh, th that was uh, visible all over. So to have an, an institution in Austria trying to, to target that issue, that is uh, something I appreciate. So Professor Ian has a question. Please turn your micro so microphone on. Thank you. Uh, mine also is a comment and not a question as much. Um, I am very impressed by the presentation this evening and I am embarrassed by my ignorance of, of work in the field. Uh, I normally um, don't spend any time in Africa uh, when I haven't, haven't set foot in Africa for something like 10 years. Um, and uh, my experience of other countries always leads me to take a very arrogant attitude towards other people of my own ilk who are involved in either not just anti-colonial studies, but uh, any developmental studies. Uh, the, the ignorance of all of our operators in the field is pathetic. And uh, it is a pity that um, courses such as this uh, have not been developed in countries like Australia, and perhaps they have in the US, but I'm certainly not aware of them. Um, and I look forward to the opportunity in due course to talk with a number of you to get to, to learn from your experience and to adapt my own approaches to something less than the the arrogant Australian that I am. So thank you very much for enabling me to participate in this discussion. And I've got a great deal of reading to do now from all of the works which you've put up in your, uh, your program uh, illustrations. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Thanks so much for, for both comments. As we mentioned at the very beginning for us too, it's, uh, it's a learning process and an unlearning process and um, um, what I can certainly say is that it also brings us very often in a quite a difficult position because if I recall how many hours we're also sitting together with students and uh, students that are also well I mean um, addressing situations that we were not aware of um, um, that creates also discomfort for us because um, we cannot simply pretend that we are here as educators and uh, we know it, uh, but um, it means that we have to rework and we have also to work on, on ourselves constantly. So it's really an ongoing process. It is a, it is a tough process. Um, um, we are repeatedly confronted with uneasy situations. Um, um, but at the same time, we have also, let's say, the, the, the feeling and the certitude that um, it changes also something. Perhaps you, Rina, would like also to say what, uh, how you are experiencing the process. Yes, I think that it's important to note that um, with a lot of uh, fields, um, interdisciplinary fields of study, that of course the critical reflection, the critical positionality and reflexivity um, have been going on for many years. So in a sense, it's not that we are now doing something um, particularly new or revolutionary in that sense. I think there are many disciplines who have already been going through this process uh, on, on different continents for a long time. However, where I see um, the, the peace and conflict studies, um, uh, the chance um, for change, let's say, uh, as Andreas mentioned, I think sometimes just as a discipline itself, uh, we have the assumption that our historical memory is that uh, one of, of being critical. So we assume 
that as a field, we are inherently critical. Uh, and I think that um, uh, as was mentioned by, by both um, uh, uh, speakers, um, you know, despite choosing perhaps critical studies or areas, um, the experience has, has often been different. Uh, and I just wanna validate that, that, that even within our own field, um, even where we may be um, feeling like we're reading critical authors, um, very often they have been authors from a, from a, per, a particular demographic or historical background or, or whatnot. But not only that, I think it's also just um, as, uh, um, as also students ourselves, um, as um, Mr. Um, Busanzi mentioned in, in the University of Bradford, uh, choosing, to, to, choosing to study a certain thing, but then realizing that, that certain thing actually um, is inherently uh, connected to that, that coloniality um, heritage. And I think that's where we are not revolutionary, right? We're, we're very much in the early stages of realizing that while we may have been taught to be criti critically analytical and critically reflective um, throughout our careers and throughout our own research processes, there were some elements that were missing in that critical aspect which now we, we have to unlearn. As, and as Andreas mentioned, um, this can be also very uncomfortable as educators ourselves, as we realize that we are not necessarily experts in everything, on everything, um, but also that there are experiences of our students, which, which we have not had, which they are also of a different generation, of a different moment in time. Uh, I mean, related to pandemic, um, also Me Too movements, Black Lives Matter, uh, global climate change, like just to situate that we are also in a, in a moment where critical, critical reflexivity is, is very important um, and, and different generations have a different role to play in addressing how to do with that. I see other hands, so um, please feel free to. Thank you very much, Andreas and Rina. Uh, Afes uh, raised his hand, so if you want to, to turn, on, turn on your microphone, please. Thank you, Clara, and thank you, uh, presenters. My question is that uh, in decolonizing, uh, in decolonizing through epistemology, which is the a convenience of knowledge, a vehicle of knowledge, how are we proposing to make this established in all institutions, including, including Africa institutions. Because I heard the second presenter that said they are still proposing to interpret the um, curriculum that it was submitted to the Senate to translate it in English. So, what effort are you putting together to try to institutionalize this same thing in Africa? Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for that question. Um, I think one of the, the main messages that I want to convey um, is that all of us have our um, decolonizing work so just to say that the perspective of, of myself um, and my colleague Andreas is that we have a container of space or let's say a sphere of influence and a sphere of control uh, and, and a sphere where we don't have any influence and no control. So I think for, for us in this work, there are the four levels. Um, and as you rightly um, refer to the epistemological aspect of knowledge. And at this very moment, we focus on our center of knowledge being the MA program of peace and conflict studies and the students that are a part of it. However, the, the, the article that I, that I referenced um, is an article um, uh, by scholars based in Africa um, on decolonizing African studies um, based in the University of Cape Town. But I see it as relevant, of course, across the board. So I think that um, on one side, from, from our perspective, we see our sphere of influence and our sphere of control being the context in which we're in and being very aware of the opportunities and also limitations of our sphere of influence and sphere of control and where we don't have necessarily influence and control and see it also as an invitation for everybody in this space, um, but also anybody who is reflecting on what that can look like to see how 
they can also go through those, those layers of decolonization in their own context. So also part of that decolonization work from my side is not to impose on any other institution or any other context or any other country or, or continent on how I perceive this work to be done, but more to, to see opportunities for each individual, um, each structure and, and each um, context to find the ways of where is my ability to decolonize in the work that I'm doing. Um, and I would be very open to hear also your ideas of where you see um, aspects of, of sphere of influence and control in your own context where this might be useful. If I may briefly add to that, um, is that, for example, we have uh, also projects uh, that we are involved in uh, with um, an Ethiopian partner university. That's uh, one example, the University of uh, Jima as um, a project that allows us to um, cooperate and to collaborate and to also have a staff exchange and a student exchange. So we very much uh, and strongly believe that it needs to go both ways in terms of um, um, people also coming to us and we also visiting other universities sharing experiences. So the colonists sing, let's say, our epistemologies and also our own curricula or our own ways of doing peace and conflict studies means also you're getting more in contact with um, other programs that um, share different experiences. Uh, but uh, where we see this also as uh, learning opportunities uh, and such projects are very much helpful to basically have also contact to other institutions. We have also um, other projects with um, partner uh, universities in the Middle East where we are also trying to develop further our respective MA programs and where we are also very much interested in, in learning how others uh, are doing it. So we see it very much as a collaborative and cooperative process but certainly one of the strengths uh, of our MA program is that we have now a certain let's say um, tradition of um, competencies in, in uh, curricular development, in capacity building, and we very much like to be involved in such projects with other universities. And we see it as a, as a, as a wonderful opportunity that we have such projects and networks with other uh, universities that are not located uh, in, in Europe. Thank you very much, uh, Lester raise his hand, so if you can turn your Microsoft on, sorry. Hi, oh, this, this has really been an exciting presentation and um, I'm so pleased to see you um, doing this kind of work. You know, part of what's uh, so Im important here is uh, that, that peace studies, um, which should be diverse has been so dominated by uh, well, people like me, uh, you know, white white American males, and uh, in fact, one of the things that's happened in recent in recent years has been increasingly uh, diverse input, and I think it's really transforming the the field. Um, I've I've posted a couple of things um, uh, to share with people on uh, my own, my own efforts and. Um, that grew out of a, of a Quaker workshop on um, uh, being allies against racism. And uh, many, many decades ago, um, and I'm, I'm trying to sort of revitalize this, this project and we appreciate any, any uh, suggestions that, that people have. One question I had um, for our, 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 our presenters um, is, is, is how to unravel the, the way in which um, the, the colonizer and colonized voices are intertwined. And I, I've, I've run into this problem both in my course, uh, which originally I called non-Western social theory in my university. When they put it uh, in the course schedule, wanted to change it to global social theory, which actually is probably more accurate because it's really more of a dialogue uh, although it's all based on non-Western authors. But um, what I found both looking for readings for my course and also 
uh, for finding authors for uh, an encyclopedia of violence, peace, and conflict that I edited was that um, you know, even, even uh, scholars from the global south are so often, they're, they're trained at the major scholars, especially many of them are trained at Western universities, the European American uh, universities. And uh, so once you get past the classics and you start to look at contemporary things, you find uh, even, um, e even our sort of ways of, uh, of, of trying to, to elevate the voices of, of um, non-white, non-Western uh, scholars is complicated by that fact. And then, of course, Western universities also you know, grab up many of the brightest minds because they can often pay more and provide more resources. And so the, some of these great uh, non-Western scholars end up teaching at um, European American universities. So I'm just wondering uh, how you folks have tried to deal with that problem. Thanks. Um, thank you for that question. I think that there are several layers to it, and I will maybe just touch on a few of them. Um, I think the, the the dichotomy of colonizer and colonized um, for me is not particularly useful, to be very honest, because I think when we think about colonization, um, from my perspective, it's not just what we sometimes identify as modern colonization uh, of Europe, um, predominantly in what is now understood as South America, Asia, and Africa, but also historical coloniality. So in that sense, it's very difficult to decipher who is colonizer and colonized. And for me, from my own positionality, uh, acknowledge that uh, in some ways or another, um, we have all been parts of that coloniality. So we have all, um, let's say, been part of, been complicit to, and also benefited in different ways from coloniality. Um, and, and at the same time, there are those who have, um, let's say, been negatively affected more than others. So of course, there is uh, a differentiation that needs to be made in terms of the impacts of colonization, uh, the impacts of what that means in terms of our field uh, of education um, and, and particularly interdisciplinary studies or social sciences, who has been impacted in particular and what does that mean for education today? Um, however, historically, I think it's very difficult to decipher um, um, that dichotomy and I don't find it, <laughs> to be very honest, particularly useful because as, as someone of Asian origin, I have been both colonized um, and, has, uh, ha and has ancestors who have been colonizers. Um, this is a reality and this is a fact. And to make that distinction only puts us into a spiral of guilt and shame and doesn't necessarily bring us forward. So I think that, that there is this element um, also in the North American context, it's also a different, um, a different location where we can speak about North America in terms of settler and colonizer, which is again, a different um, language which needs to be differentiated in terms of indigenous persons. Um, and there is, I think uh, in each context, uh, whether we're speaking about um, contexts that were colonized in modern colonization or historical colonization processes, there's so much nuance there in terms in terms of that language. Um, in terms of elevation uh, of non-white, non-European, non-American um, uh, scholars and practitioners and researchers, indeed, this is the challenge, right? Because of that uh, of that structure, because of the epistemological. Um, uh, colonization, the personal and the relation, relational, because of that, it is very difficult to ensure that, that students, that colleagues, and that leaders are uplifted um, based on that, uh, based on those four layers, if we refer to it as colonization and not decolonization. So indeed, that is part of the challenge, I think. Uh, and, and the reason that I break it down is I think that there are, we can break it down into steps, right? We often become overwhelmed by the fact that we have to now decolonize the whole world and the universe and, and, and everything at once. And this is like an, a, an un, undoable task. And I think, you know, it does start with the personal. It does connect to the relational. It does link to the epistemological and the structural. And in a way, I think each of us here are connected to those just by being part of this symposium. And I think it's important to relate to, again, 
what is my sphere of influence and control if I'm sitting in a recruitment commission? In what role do I play in ensuring that either students or colleagues or whatnot are having opportunities? It's even sometimes the question when it comes to diversity, equity, inclusion, where am I even posting that position, right? Am I posting it? Am I spreading the word uh, to diverse um, locations in the world? Or am I just spreading it within my own location, which of course um, has different um, relations to access? But I think I'll end there. There's also a few other hands. Uh, Andreas, I don't know if you wanted to add something there. Yeah, perhaps just quickly my my own uh, experience and approach uh, in, in this respect. What I consider to be, let's say, most interesting also for me is those kind of um, mixed first spaces Homi Baba is referring to that cannot be itself, uh, resolved in one way or, or another. And I would say that, um, yeah, peace and conflict studies too, um, learning can take place, especially in in areas where we, um, I don't know, encountering some form of creolization of, of knowledge or hybridization of, of knowledge. Uh, so I would say that especially the field of post and decolonial studies, it's not necessarily about um, pushing some form of non-Western knowledge uh, against Western knowledge, but how to see how knowledge itself has already become global, even in very unequal terms. And it's more about dismantling certain forms of hegemonic discourse that are still serving the interests of uh, certain uh, centers by trying to pluralize uh, differently uh, relationships. So that for me is a, a reason already why I'm very much interested in, in reading a, a, a lot of, um, of, of books that um, were written elsewhere and that uh, reflect other situations because I find it most fascinating and they kind of also open new new horizons for me. But it means also that um, the, the history of Europe in the end is even more complicated uh, because colonialism did not just take place elsewhere, be it um, in Asia, in, in Africa, but also Europe was colonized. You can take the case of Ireland, uh, you could take uh, the case of uh, most parts of Europe, and you could say with Hannah Arendt that we find that um, Europe too uh, experienced a form of um, uh, continental imperialism that a lot of the fascist and uh, totalitarian states were using colonial techniques and um, employing these technical colleagues on, on their own people. So um, I would say that most parts of Europe uh, made an experience without perhaps realizing it of becoming colonized. So it's uh, decolonizing means also decolonizing ourselves and trying to also liberate uh, ourselves from, from this kind of um, legacies that um, have been with us so much. Thank you. Uh, since we are out of time, uh, we will give the uh, time to ask, uh, to look on, and then Frank, and please, if you have some questions, the speakers leave, uh, leave the, the, their mails to, to be in Thank contact you. with you. Please, Frank, uh, look on, uh, raise your hand first, so Thank if... if uh, you... so, thank you very much. I just wanted to uh, thank the uh, presenters for their very thoughtful analysis of some of the challenges that we face in universities and in other educational institutions about trying to decolonize the ways in which we teach, the ways in which we learn. Uh, the question, uh, the particular question that I'd like to raise is, and it's actually anchored in some ways in the... Uh, quote that Andreas gave from uh, Linda Tuawai Tua Smith, uh, who I think, among others, has actually uh, put uh, a critical lens on the ways in which universities often conduct what they call research. Uh, in other words, a kind of need for deep reflection on how we actually carry research out and the methods, the assumptions underlying research processes and what is often left out in those processes, how often that is quite a hegemonic approach and how often it's wrapped up with assumptions about objectivity 
often it's gendered and often it is racialized, but that is not acknowledged. Now, Linda actually uh, um, um, underlines that. And I think it's actually interesting. This is one of the, one of the more recent books that's come out. I, I don't know whether that's sort of coming up on the screen, but she's got the introduction to that. And it's actually you're bringing together uh, of a lot of indigenous voices around uh, research processes. And in that, among other things, in the introduction, she talks about uh, the importance of hearing different voices, critical voices, and not assuming that Western-centric perspectives are sort of universal voices. You know, the, in other words, I think some of the things that you were saying, Andreas, about how sort of the European or the Western perspective was taken to be the assumptions about sort of universal and sort of almost an exclusive, exclusive assumptions around that, which denied other voices. Now, the particular question that I'd like to ask is, in terms of students, in terms of reflection on things, is the ways in which history or knowledge uh, is uh, represented in particular institutions within our societies and cultures. And I'm thinking particularly of uh, ethno ethnographic museums, uh, national history museums and war museums. What histories are told in those places? And to what extent uh, are they important sites for critical reflection, uh, engagement about the ways in which history is told? And if I can Mike, just give one example from the Australian uh, perspective, uh, we have uh, a major uh, war, his war museum uh, in, in Canberra, the, the capital. Uh, however, that has become the, the site, if you like, of some uh, contest around the ways in which history is told. Uh, among other things, there's been an argument put that uh, in the 200 years uh, of, uh, since colonisation, uh, there is in that museum no mention of the fact that uh, there were frontier wars that were fought, that there were many massacres that occurred, and that that is not represented in the, the National War Memorial Museum. Now, that's, that's a question about honesty and history telling. Yet, uh, as we know, we've probably got, in terms of deep history, 50,000 years of history in, in, on the Australian continent, right? We've got 50,000, 60,000 years. Yet, in the, in the main museum in Canberra, uh, there is invisibility of issues around the violence of, of the colonisation that actually occurred there. Now, that's a, an issue. But I th those sorts of issues, I think there is a need for honesty around the ways in which we tell history, not so much to say, well, that's the fault of the present generation, but it's rather how do we actually trans transition, transform some of our thinking, if you like, and I'm, here I'm, I'm talking in terms of peace education so that we actually get a deeper understanding of what's happened in the past so we can actually move forward in constructive ways so that we can actually deal with conflicts more honestly, deal with history more honestly, and also uh, in some ways resist the... And here I'm bringing in some of the, you know, if you like, some of the critical future stuff. You know, we know that, you know, people like... Uh, uh, Johan Galtung, uh, Elise Balding and others, uh, they were also critical futurists. And they're actually talking about, among other things, the danger sometimes of colonising the future with some of the assumptions that we take with it. So honesty about, you know, what's happened in the past, listening to different voices, hearing those voices, but at the same time being aware that if we take some of those assumptions into the future and we don't actually critically reflect on some of those things in our classrooms, in our curriculum, then we're actually passing those things on into the future. In some ways, we're colonising the future rather than opening up alternative futures, peaceable futures, you know, futures in which there's uh, uh, social and ecological peace. I might just leave it at that, though. Sorry, I've been talking quite a bit. But I just thought I was. I wanted to thank the two presenters for...
their contributions. And I think what they're doing is, you know, it sounds like it's very valuable work. Thank you. Uh, maybe I just a very short um, responses. I know that we're also still waiting for the question from Lukong Stella. Um, just as a person who holds uh, a Canadian passport, um, I think you know your reference to in terms of history, um, retelling history, reflecting on the past and whatnot. Um, I think there, you know, there are some uh, connections uh, in relation to to the Australian case where. I see in Canada, for example, and particularly related to atrocities committed against Indigenous persons, but also lack of knowledge of atrocities committed against Indigenous persons. And this is very key in terms of our current history. So it is very difficult for us to even speak about reconciliation, um, justice, or new truths, or even how our anthropological museums are able to tell the past when we are in a moment in time where we are still uncovering the past. Um, so just to say that I think that this is really also part of that, that process of, of, of even knowing atrocities that have been committed uh, in order to be able to acknowledge them and then to look at, okay, in terms of the museums that we have, which have attempted to tell histories of the past, um, what has been missing there based on erasure that has existed, at least in the Canadian context. Okay, so we continue with our last question or comment. Please, Lukong, you have the, the space to talk. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good day, everybody. Uh, I do appreciate uh, the presenters for the very insightful presentation. You know, as you presented, my mind immediately tried to link your presentation within the African context. So, um, when we look at Africa, we get to understand the narratives and discussions about the failure of African states to significantly alter the inherited uh, post-colonial state, society politics, as well as uh, peace building, which has had very little success in Africa. So my question then is, if we have to look at Africa and the fact that, uh, the elusiveness of peace actually remains a thing, even with several concepts like African solutions to African problems, as well as other UN peacekeeping efforts that have been taking place in Africa. Would you actually say that uh, working towards this decolonization of African states and advancing this uh, decolonial peace paradigm could be the pathway towards attaining and sustaining peace in Africa. Why I ask this question, I also keep in mind the fact that we are currently experiencing the new waves of neocolonialism in Africa. And so if we are engaging with uh, the colonial peace paradigm in, in situations where there are colonial uh, legacies, there are previous colonial legacies, Yet we are talking about new waves of neocolonialism. How do we balance the two? How do we balance the colonial peace and the new way and the waves of neocolonialism actually happening? So that's my question. Thank you. If I may respond in connection to on one side this question, but also something that has come up in the chat from Afiz Sufiano um, in terms of uh, is decolonization really possible without an African indigenous language as a vehicle of impacting knowledge in African institutions. I think that there, there's a connection here in terms of, of um, what the post-colonial state looks like. Um, I mean, which uh, specific um, uh, African country we're also referring to, but also in relation to whether decolonization um, can happen without indigenous language as a vehicle. Um, and I just wanna to refer to debates that have happened um, very strongly on the African continent in the 1970s um, by African scholars, for example, Nigerian scholar Chinua Achebe, who very consciously chose to write in English. Um, one of the reasons being that he claimed that English for Nigeria in that context 
was a connecting language and not a dividing language. Whereas with the, the strong diversity of languages in the context of Nigeria, this was often creating oppositional forces of, of ethno-nationalist identity. So for him, it was a conscious choice to write in English. At the same time, you had scholars such as Ngogi uh, Wationgo, who, who used to write in English and then consciously began to write in his native Gikuyu language and then was translated by someone else um, back into English. Also, also, again, a very conscious decision um, by a Kenyan scholar to only write in his native tongue, claiming that he refused to write firstly in the colonial tongue of English. And I reference this because I think that that these two examples of, of um, a Nigerian scholar and a Kenyan scholar show also just that diversity alongside um, what decolonizing uh, uh, work can look like already happening in the 70s and very strong and sometimes fiery debates that happened between those two scholars, even in print, right? Really calling each other out on the fact that why are you choosing to write in a colonial language or why are you choosing to write in a language which is only accessible to a certain number of people therefore being exclusive and not inclusive. And I think when we think about uh, uh, the post-colonial state uh, in terms of, of a heritage that many African states uh, uh, have uh, experienced in very different ways, um, and this neo-colonial uh, um, um, experience that you speak of, I think that, that it's really important to reflect on those interdependent structures. So on one side, um, if we speak about the nation building process, um, we need to acknowledge the fact that, of course, there is criticism on what post-colonial states can and should and would look like. Um, and at the same time, being very aware, again, if we if we break down the division of colonizer of, and colonized, there are people who have benefited from colonialism in, in, in those pre-colonial states. Um, and there are also systems of, of structures and, of, and, and oppression which existed prior to being colonized. And this is very often the, the challenge, right? Um, where do we begin the decolonization process um, when those inherent structures and, and, uh, and also epistemological knowledges are so inherent with one another? So I don't have a, a concrete answer at all, um, uh, but only uh, um, uh, reverence and also appreciation um, for these questions, because I think that in each context, the experience is also very different in terms of what the state looks like now, but also what types of conflicts exist now. And very often we can root many of those conflicts uh, on one side to colonial inheritance, but also pre-colonial um, issues that existed even before, um, if we speak about modern colonization. Um, I myself have someone, uh, as I already mentioned, of mixed origin, but I was raised in Nigeria. And, and I can tell you that I was not given access to Nigerian authors as a child. I was given access to authors from um, the United States and Britain, being in an international school. And as an adult, there is very much unlearning that also a person raised on a continent um, who did not have access to that literature needs to do in terms of my own unlearning and decolonizing, decolonizing praxis. How can I access scholars who are not exposed to me despite being based on the African continent? Um, how can I acknowledge also that, that although I had Nigerian teachers and African teachers, that the majority were still from the global north and just and not in a judgment, right? Not saying good or bad or, or wrong knowledge or good knowledge, but just being aware of that and saying, OK, if that is a situation, who do I choose to read now? Do I choose to to read um, Ronald Dahl? Nothing against it. Right. But that was uh, the British literature that I was raised as a child. Or do I actively try to seek out also other literature? And I think if it comes to the post-colonial state, um, even just theories of what post-colonial states look like, we also need to question um, who we're able to read to understand uh, what that um, neo-colonialism and post-transformation uh, can look like. So thank you, everyone, for participating, especially both speakers and we will see you we will see you uh, in the next session on next wednesday uh, if you have some questions both speakers leave their mails so you can be in contact uh, thank you george and all the participants and see you next wednesday thank you, thank you.